Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Angela Mackey, and you're watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. I'm a pediatrician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota, and host of this show about pediatric health topics, where we take and answer your questions live. Today, we are discussing congenital ear anomalies or malformations and how they are treated. Joining us for this discussion is Dr. Waleed Jabril. Dr. Jabril is a craniofacial and pediatric plastic surgeon in the Division of Plastic Surgery and the Department of Surgery. He's also an assistant professor of plastic surgery at Mayo Clinic. Please send in your questions about today's topic, and we'll try our best to review them during the live broadcast. Dr. Jabril, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Matke, for the introduction, and thank you for having me. This, this is such a great topic and something that I feel, uh, mm. even myself, I don't feel like I know a lot about. Mm. So I'm really looking forward to learning more about what are the mm. options for, for children that are born with you know, malformations of their ear. Yep. So what exactly constitutes an ear anomaly, um, and what kind of ear deformities are treated here at Mayo Clinic? Um, so Dr. Matke, ear deformities could range um, anywhere uh, from a small and mind alterations to the overall outer ear shape uh, to complete absence of all portions of the external ear. Um, all conditions of ear deformities are treated at Mayo, and these conditions range from a minor deformity that could be easily corrected at an earlier age to complete absence of the ear, which could be corrected at any time, and that may require an operation. Excellent. Um, so if a child is born kind of, you know, they're a couple of weeks old and there might be a little bit of deformity of their ear. Are there non-surgical options to treat kind of minor deformities or malformations of the ear, or is this something that's always going to be surgical? That's a great question. Um, if, you know, if the ear deformity is kind of identified at an early age, then there are a lot of options to treat this without needing an operation. And we usually look at um, the cutoff point at five to six months of age. Um, when kids are born, there is a very high level of estrogen hormone that they got from their mom. And that mm -hmm. keeps, that makes the ear moldable. Uh, okay. So the ear could be shipped without, without actually needing an operation. And to talk about what constitute ear deformities and what ear deformities are, I think it's helpful to kind of review what forms a normal uh, ear and how a normal ear looks like. And I do have on this screen kind of an illustration of what, what, what constitutes a normal ear. So the, when we talk about an ear, we talk about an outer ear. And on this show, we'll be focusing on the outer ear mostly. But the ear has a lot of um, concave and convex surfaces, and there are a lot of um, folds that they need to form while the child and the infant is still um, in, inside the uterus. And after they're born, some of these folds are not complete. Um, and that would fo what form some of the ear deformities. But looking at this example, um, we're looking at an outer fold, what we call a helix. And we're looking at an inner fold, which we call an anti-helix. And between these two, we have what we call a scaf and a concha. And then there are two little prominence around the external opening, what we call a tragus and an anti-tragus. This is generally what constitutes a normal outer ear. Any deviation from this could lead to any could lead to congenital ear differences. Uh, there are some that we could treat um, at an earlier age with an ear with an ear molding. And uh, here I have some examples of uh, what ear molding. Uh, could do. On, on the left side, you could see a, a child that is uh, born with folding of the, of the upper third of an ear. And this child had a complete correction of the ear difference by placing a molding device that looks like this. Um, the duration of treatment could range anywhere from, from um, four to six weeks to three months, depending on how severe the deformity um, is. And we do have some other examples of abnormal folding of the ear that completely corrected by just placing a molding device that does not require an operation. Is the molding device something that they wear all day um, or is it just certain times during the day? Um, for the molding device to be effective, it's better to be worn all, all day. Sometimes, you know, parents may need to take it off um, for a few minutes just to clean the area underneath it, but to get the best treatment out of, um, to get the best outcome, it's better to be worn um, the entire day. Okay, 
Excellent. Mm. So another kind of ear difference or external ear difference is when children are born with very prominent ears or large ears. Um, is that something that um, it can be treated cosmetically um, if it's something that the family desires? Yes, yes. Okay. And a lot of, and, and, and it's more common than we think. And sometimes mm -hmm. it happens on, on one side and it doesn't happen on both sides. And it's a source of a lot of psychologic trauma to kids. Mm -hmm. They go to, to kindergarten, they be called names and they get bullied. And it really affects the, the, the mental and psychologic development of a lot of children. Mm -hmm. um, so we like to kind of evaluate kids before they go to kindergarten and get this problem addressed at an earlier age so the child doesn't have to suffer and live with this kind of difference um, for their early childhood. Uh, some of these um, uh, differences and deformities could be corrected with an ear molding if we mm -hmm. identify them earlier. So if you see a child at two weeks of age, which is a perfect time to start an ear molding, then yes, we could do that. And you could correct the entire deformity um, over a period of month to two. Beyond six months, the treatment would depend on, on what we are looking at. And I do have an example here of what constitutes a prominent ear. And if you look at, if you look at this photo, um, you see the child has a complete outer lining of the external ear. But if you look in the middle of the ear, um, there are no folds. Those folds we're talking about, we don't see any folds. We just see a flat surface. And that sometimes gives the illusion that the ear is sticking out from the head more than the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time it happens on both sides, but it could happen in only one side. And for that, if we are looking at a two week old, a four week old, then yes, for sure, we could treat that by just placing a molding device for two to three months. But if we are looking at a child who is three uh, years old and the ear is not as moldable, then we're talking about correcting this with a small with a small operation, trying to recreate those folds and push the ear back so it doesn't stick out from, from the skull. And the timing of that, if, if it's not done, um, caught early and stuff, what would be the, the surgical correction before kindergarten? It could be done at any time. It could okay. be done at, at any time. And, and most of the insurance companies will cover for that uh, okay. because, you know, in, in, in children, I think insurance companies will look at this different uh, because it's not really a cosmetic operation on a child uh, since it will have a lot of psychological consequences mm -hmm. and negative consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so we can, we can help with that. We can write to the insurance company and explain to them why this is not a cosmetic operation. And most of the time we're successful in getting the insurance companies to pay for this. That's fantastic. Um, there's another type of ear difference called microtia. Um, what is that? And are there are there different kind of stages or types of that that you could you could share with us? Yes. Um, so we use a uh, term uh, microtia to talk about um, a deformity or a difference um, when most of the ear structures are congenitally absent. In in certain kids, the whole outer ear is missing. Sometimes even the external opening is missing, and in certain cases, the middle ear is also not not formed uh, the way it should it should have formed. And we talk about microtia, and there is another word, what we call anosia. So microtia is when we're missing most of the ear structures. And, and in anosia, uh, we're looking at complete absence of the external ear structures, including the, the cartilage and also including the lobule, which is a soft piece of the ear at the most, at the most um, uh, inferior part of the ear. And I do have some examples of, of what, what, um, what microtia looks like and what enosia looks like. And if you can look in this screen, you see the, the, the kind of the picture on the left side, there is a complete absence of the outer ear structure. And we don't even see the soft lobule. And when I talk about lobule, I talk about the piece of the ear that the ear piercing goes into. So even that's absent. Um, you see in the middle one, um, a less uh, severe form of that, which we call a lobular uh, mic uh, microtia, when we're missing most of the ear structures with the exception of that soft spot, which we call the lobule. And the one on the right side um, is also a, a, milder, a milder form of microtia uh, where we're missing most of the ear structures, uh, but then we have some remnants of a soft tissue and also a cartilage. Excellent. So when we're not seeing, you know, the, the entrance to like the middle ear and the inner ear, um, are these children um, associated with increased risk of hearing difficulties? 
Yes, um, hearing difficulty could happen, and 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 uh, 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 for a child to have a normal speech, they need to have a normal hearing because that's that's the input, mm -hmm. and that's how they train their brain. Um, if we have a microtia on one side or an anosia on one side, sometimes hearing abnormality could also happen. Um, that could range from anywhere from affecting the middle ear to an absent canal to also abnormality of the inner ear, which could occasionally happen. It's not as common, but it could mm -hmm. happen. And if we have a hearing problem on one side, then the child could develop a normal speech, but they do have problem with localization. If someone is talking to them, they mm -hmm. don't know if that person is, 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 is sitting on the right side or the left side. If microtia is happening on both sides, then there is a higher likelihood of having hearing problems. And trying to get that addressed at an earlier age is extremely important because when we look at microtia, yes, we look at the appearance of the ear, but more importantly, we look at the hearing function. So when we treat these conditions, we kind of aim our treatment at addressing both of them. And then the timing of that is different depending on the child's age, the severity of the ear deformity. And then sometimes you could do some hearing aids that do not require an operation. And sometimes they may need an operation for that. Uh, but to be able to decide on that, um, the child needs to be evaluated by a dedicated team to have a complete evaluation. And we can formulate a treatment plan um, after that evaluation. Okay. Do we know what causes microtia? Is this something that is genetic mm. or, or hereditary and could potentially occur in future children? We, we don't know um, all the reasons for, for microtia. We do have some theories that some, some of the blood vessels, um, given, given the ear structure, some blood flow while the child is developing in the first 20 weeks of pregnancy, um, sometimes there is some impairment of that blood flow that could lead to microtia. And there are different kinds of microtia. There is what we call an isolated microtia, when microtia could just be the only problem that the child um, is facing. Sometimes we're looking at something called syndromic microtia, when, when the absent ear is just a manifestation of other congenital differences that we don't know about or we know about. And those constitute certain syndromes. So some of those run in families, but most of the microtia cases, most of them is what we call a sporadic. And it's just mm -hmm. a random mutation that happened. So having a child with microtia doesn't mean that you, your second child will have a microtia, but before, before considering having another child, it's helpful to meet with a genetic specialist and to meet with a dedicated team to have a complete evaluation. Number one, to make sure that microtia is not part of a syndrome, Mm -hmm. that that is running in families and number two to see if there is any problems that could be associated with microtia sometimes we see kidney problems with microtia sometimes we see jaw problems with microtia sometimes one side of the face is not developed at the same at the same rate as at the other side so one side ends up being a smaller what we call a hemifacial microsomia so identifying that I think is crucial before mm -hmm. we, you know, before we, before you can determine the risk of, of having future kids with microtia, but we don't know the entire um, and the exact um, etiology and the reason why, why microtia happens. Okay. So let's talk about some treatment options. What if a child is born with a missing ear or microtia? Um, this is, you're the person they come to. So tell us, tell us, what can you, uh, what can you offer them? Yeah. So there are different treatment options, and, and those treatment options kind of evolve, evolve over time. Um, uh, in about over 100 years ago, the, 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 the standard treatment um, was to build an ear from, from a rib cartilage, uh, mm -hmm. taking a small piece from a rib cartilage when the child is older, uh, typically 8 to 10 years of age, and then carve that ear cartilage to kind of simulate the structures of the ear. That's an operation that is done in multiple stages. Uh, the first stage is to take the piece of the ear cartilage, place it underneath the skin where the ear is missing. And then the child will undergo some additional operation that could range from two to four surgeries, trying to refine what we, what we are looking at. And those surgeries are usually spaced uh, like three to six months apart. That is what is called the standard treatment for the ear reconstruction. Um, in the past 30 years, uh, Dr. Ron, uh, John Reinish in Los Angeles 
introduce a new technique for ear reconstruction with an implant uh, mm -hmm. that has many advantages that we'll be, we'll be talking about. Uh, so those are the two main treatment options, surgical treatment options for microtia. Sometimes the child um, uh, is, not, is, not, is not what we call a good candidate to undergo um, either um, ear reconstruction with a rib or with an implant. And some families may consider placing a prosthesis uh, that looks like an ear, but that comes with problems because sometimes the child that at school playing with other kids and then the prosthesis falls and then they have to kind of put it back on. Mm -hmm. And you could appreciate the amount of trauma that the child goes, goes through with that, mm -hmm. with that option. So we don't typically recommend that as the first treatment option. That's what we call as a backup if other treatment options don't, don't work. But those are the two treatment, uh, treatment options. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about that first kind of, uh, the treatment option about the rib cartilage. Why do they have to wait until they're eight to 10 years of age to do that one? Why could it be something that they start before they go to kindergarten? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And, and when we, when we talk about uh, building an ear, uh, from a cartilage, we need to have enough cartilage. Mm. Um, when you're looking at the uh, chest and the amount of cartilage that a three-year-old um, has, it's definitely less than what an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old child um, have. So we need to have enough cartilage to allow us to build the ear and at the same time, leave enough cartilage behind to provide protection to what is inside the chest. Mm -hmm. And I do have here on the screen an example of what, what that looks like. Um, what you see on this, on this screen, um, you see the breastbone in the middle, you see some ribs, and between the ribs and the breastbone, there is a soft uh, structure, what we call a costal cartilage uh, or a rib cartilage. And then that is typically taken and carved into an ear structure and place underneath the skin um, of a child. But you need to have, we need to have enough cartilage. And typically kids don't have enough cartilage till they're um, at least seven to eight years of age uh, to do that. And that's why, that's why we have to wait that long. Okay, gotcha. <clears throat> and I do have on this, um, on this screen is just uh, a follow up on what we were talking about. Uh, that cartilage that was carved before now is placed underneath the skin to give the ear the structure. And then the child will undergo um, two or three operations to refine that and allow the ear to stick out, to stick out from the skull. So it gives it a normal, normal appearance. Is there anything that you need to do to have enough room in the skin to place that cartilage? Do you have to do any type of expanders or anything like that in the part of the process? Yes, sometimes if you don't have if you don't have enough skin, then you could you could um, expand the skin, and that means placing a um, what uh, what we call an expander, which is essentially a balloon underneath the skin, and we fill that balloon gradually over two weeks to expand the skin to leave to leave enough room. There are some limitations of that because sometimes with microtia, uh, kids do have hair growth over the over the side of the skin where we would place a cartilage underneath, and we don't have mm -hmm. control over that. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of limits this option. If you know if there is if there is hair, what we call a um, low hairline. If we do have that, then it's so hard to get rid of it. And, and then sometimes we are forced to put, you know, to put the uh, implant underneath. Uh, sometimes there is just not enough skin or the child may have had an operation in the past to help with the hearing or creating the outer opening. So the, the skin is not enough and we need to expand that skin to have enough room to place an implant. But yes, sometimes that is needed. Okay. Well, can you share with us a little bit more about the implant um, and how that works? Yeah, so the, 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 the implant operation is, is, was introduced about over 30 years ago by uh, Dr. John Reinish. And the idea behind that um, is to avoid taking a piece of a rib cartilage, because sometimes we do see deformities in the, um, in the rib. Um, it's a more painful operation. And it just puts the child um, through a less invasive operation with less uh, recovery. So Dr. Reinish came up with this idea of using what we call a porous polyethylene implant. And that's a replacement of the rib cartilage itself and is used to carve an, um, an ear structure. To place that, we don't have to place it underneath the skin. Um, it needs to be covered by a thin layer from underneath the scalp, what we call um, a flap. 
and then we take a small piece of skin, what we call a skin graft, to wrap the ear around it. Uh, that gets rid of um, what, what you were talking about, Dr. Matke, before. If you don't have enough skin, do you need mm. to put an expander? So that, that kind of bypasses this problem. So you don't have to go through that process of, of tissue expansion. It also has other advantages. And some of those advantages, you can do the operation at a much, much younger age. Mm -hmm. You could do the operation when the child is only three and a half years old or four years old before they go to kindergarten. The um, third advantage of using an implant, that is only one stage operation. So you don't have to put the child through three to four operations when they're older mm -hmm. and they have already lived with a difference and a deformity through kindergarten and early school years. So you could complete the reconstruction before the child goes to kindergarten and now they have a normal looking ear with the hope to lead a normal life. Um, I <clears throat> Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, so I do have some I do have some examples here of what um, of what the implant um, looks like. Uh, the first one is uh, showing Dr. Dr. Reinish, who is a great a great mentor, and I had the opportunity to train with him and work with him. Um, such a wonderful man, and he has helped thousands of kids uh, around the world. And I cannot I cannot thank him thank him enough uh, for what he has done. The this is an example of the implant that um, Dr. Reinish uh, came up with. Uh, which shows you the ear structure kind of carved from that from that implant. This implant is mostly uh, preformed. Um, and then the implant is covered with a tissue from underneath underneath the scalp, uh, what we call a fascia, okay? And then that's wrapped with the skin graft um, that is taken from from the groin uh, or from the or from the abdomen itself. And it's a one stage operation. You could see the difference here on this child on the right side. The child is completely missing an ear with a small soft part. And now on the on the on the right side, you see an ear is completely formed with the implant. Is one operation. The child is only four years old and now could go to kindergarten with a normally formed ear without facing the consequences of living with, with, the, congenital, with the congenital differences. These pictures um, are from an article published by, uh, by Dr. Reinish and Dr. Tahir. That's a beautiful outcome. Um, are some of these surgeries done mm -hmm. in conjunction with ENT doctors mm -hmm. if there's concerns about their middle ear and their hearing? Yes. Okay. And do you guys, mm -hmm. are you able to do the surgeries at the same time or does it depend on the patient? It depends on the patient and it depends on, on what the patient needs. Um, uh, the, the creating an ear is important, um, but the priority is, is a normal hearing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that needs to take place at early, at early, early, early age, mm -hmm. uh, even before one year of age, uh, that's, that's the goal. Sometimes an operation is not needed and kids could have an, what we call a hearing aid that they could wear and put on just like, an, like, a, like a headset. Uh, sometimes that helps with, with hearing till the child is older. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the only thing that is missing is just the external canal and that, and that just needs an operation. Mm -hmm. uh, those could be done at the same, at the same time. So each, each patient is different, each situation is different. And the ENT surgeons and craniofacial surgeons work very closely in evaluating these patients to come up with a plan and also decide on the sequence and the time and the time of treatment. Okay, excellent. So do you guys have a multidisciplinary team that you work together um, with these patients? Yes, um, there is. Um, we have we have uh, an ENT team that evaluates patients with congenital with congenital differences and and hear deformities. We have a multidisciplinary craniofacial team, mm -hmm. an ENT surgeon and a craniofacial surgeon at essential parts of of all of this of all of these teams. Um, we do have a speech pathologist um, that is also involved with the team. We have a psychologist, a social worker and an automaxillofacial surgeon. We have a big team that evaluates, that provides comprehensive evaluation of a child mm -hmm. with a difference. And then the importance of that is to make sure that there is nothing else that we're missing that we need to evaluate. And mm -hmm. we have this regular team meetings uh, after we evaluate um, the patient to come up with a plan. We all sit at a big conference room and discuss each child problem. Um, and those meetings are regular meetings and then sit down with the family and discuss with them all uh, potential treatment, treatment options. Okay, excellent. You know, you mentioned, I think, um, 
I think the main advantage about the implant, um, but were there any other advantages to the implant that you wanted to discuss? Yeah, so the, the what what I like about it, um, Dr. Matke, is like, like for me, I, I struggle a lot accepting, um, accepting just having a child live through his early or her early childhood with mm-hmm. a congenital difference. It's just so hard for me to tell the families, yes, your child is born with an ear deformity, but go home, live with it, and have the child live with it for 10 years. And when mm-hmm. your child is 10 years old, come back and we can talk about options. Mm-hmm. I, I, I guess I struggle with that a lot. And, and I, I, I like this option because you could, you could create a normal looking ear before the child interacts with other kids during kindergarten years and early school years. And then you could put the child through only one general anesthetic and instead of putting the child through three or four mm-hmm. or four operations okay. um, through their early childhood. The, and the other thing that we, that, that's also I like about it, about this, we, we know that kids develop their memory around three to four years of age. Mm-hmm. So if you do the operation at an early age, they don't have the memory of, of that traumatic experience of going through an operation, which could be very frightening for kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, so most kids, when you do the operation at that early age, they don't even remember they had an ear difference. They don't even remember they mm-hmm. had to go through through an operation. That doesn't mean that the operation cannot be done in older kids. It could be done in older mm-hmm. kids, but this is one of the advantages why we like to do the operation at much, much um, earlier age. And then we don't have to make an incision in the child chest, remove a piece of cartilage that could lead to some to some deformity mm-hmm. in the future. Mm-hmm. So now we're kind of tr- trading one difference with with a deformity, uh, mm-hmm. which sometimes is not is not a fair trade. Uh, mm-hmm. But again, I just wanted to highlight that the 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 cartilage reconstruction is the gold standard and what people have been doing for for so many years and over 100 years. Um, mm-hmm. The implant is an alternative to that and the outcomes are very comparable, uh, mm-hmm. if not if not better. Okay. Is there any difference in recovery um, between these two different um, procedures? Um, yes. Uh, so the when we talk about the cartilage, we're talking about a minimum of, of three operations. Mm-hmm. Um, each operation comes with recovery. Um, so you could add that to recovery. So the recovery over time is more with one with one operation. Um, usually the first operation, when a rib cartilage is taken, the child spends one night in the hospital. Um, and then the recovery from that is about, I would say about two to four weeks or sometimes longer. With the implant, the child could go home, go home the same, the same day. The next day they could go back to their normal activities. Um, and then the recovery from that is much, much shorter. Um, I would say about half the recovery. And then mm-hmm. if everything goes well and there is no need for minor touch-ups, then it's one operation, is one recovery. When the child is through it, there is no need for, for additional operations. Okay, fantastic. Now, is this um, ear reconstruction something that would be covered by insurance? Uh, yes, uh, okay. because this is one one of the you know one of the congenital differences um, that we when we when we write for insurance companies, we tell them um, mm-hmm. this this child is born with this with this difference. These are the reasons um, that we need to get this operation covered by insurance, and it's typically covered by insurance. If we decide to do an operation, one thing that we can provide to at uh, at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Matke, is to submit for what we call an insurance prior authorization. So we write for the insurance company, we get an approval from them before we do the operation. So the parents will know before going through the operation, whether the insurance is paying for it or not. Um, That's something that we could do as well. That's fantastic. So as we kind of end our time, someone's listening to this, a family is listening to a, you know, grandparent, and they're thinking, this is something, you know, that my child has or my grandchild, how can they get in contact with Mayo Clinic if this is um, something they wanted to pursue for evaluation here? Yeah, so the, you could email me um, if you have, if you have any questions about this, and I will make sure that we, you know, we, we get you in and make an appointment. The, uh, in, with all kids, it, it's a priority to get them, to get them in. So we try to avoid even, even having them wait 
uh, for a week or two. So if the family is interested in evaluation the next day, that's something that we could we could easily accommodate. Um, and we treat that we on in all kids in our craniofacial team that is a priority. If you call in today, you will definitely get in within within five to seven days. If not, if not the next day. Um, I do have a phone number too on this screen. That's our appointment main appointment office for the craniofacial clinic. Um, you could call this number from from eight to five, and and we'll make sure you you get all the appointments lined up for you. And the number just for people listening on our podcast is 507-538-4930. And his email address is G-I-B-R-E-E-L dot Waleed, W-A-L-E-E-D at mayo.edu. So that is excellent information. I really appreciate you expanding my knowledge about this today. Do you have any closing thoughts or things you'd like to share with us? No, it is. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this is one of you know one of the areas that I have have like, passions for, and 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 I've seen kids struggling with living with an absent with an absent ear. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted to kind of um thank you know my my mentors uh and senior partners, Doctor uh, Byte and Doctor Mardini. There are two other craniofacial surgeons um that really helped with kind of expanding the clinic, and also my mentors who trained me to do this, Dr. Ryanish and, 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 and Dr. McGee. Uh, those are two of, my, two of my mentors. And the nice thing about it, if you come in here and we need to evaluate you, then you'll get an opportunity to kind of discuss all of these treatment options with all of uh, uh, my four, you know, uh, all of those four senior craniofacial surgeons and, and, and partners. Um, the, you know, ear reconstruction and dealing, you know, treating a child with an ear difference, sometimes, you know, parents just don't know about it. Um, they, they just accept it. They say, oh, this is just how, you know, how the ear looks like. And I just want them to know, um, to whoever is listening to this show, that there are a lot of options, a lot of options that we could talk about. Having a child with an ear difference doesn't mean that the child will definitely require an operation. There are a lot of things that we could do without, without an operation, especially if we identify it at an, earlier, at an earlier age. And sometimes people think that there are just no treatment options for this because we, they, we know a friend, we know a family member, um, who is 40, 50 year old is missing with an living with an absent ear, and there must be like just no treatment options. But there mm-hmm. are treatment options, um, and you do have access to a f- craniofacial clinic um, uh, team. Uh, call any call any time between between eight to five, and we'll make sure we get you seen by the right team uh, within within the same within the same week. Excellent. Thank you for for all your time and um, for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Matke. um, And thank you for the opportunity. Oh, absolutely. And and thanks everyone who listened and and watched. Um, You can catch our next show, uh, which will be about understanding the effects of racism on childhood health and also talking to your child about race and racism. Please join us for this powerful discussion, which will be on June 10th at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Remember, everyone, wear your mask, practice social distancing if you're not vaccinated, and please get your vaccine when it's available to you. Have a great day.